tonight. Scorching heat. Mother Nature strikes again with severe heat waves as a result of global warming. Escalating tensions. New settlements agreed upon but no change in the Israeli and Palestinian relations. Rapid escalation. Australia now grapples with a damning situation as COVID cases lead the race. National celebrations. China expedites a grand show to celebrate a historic anniversary. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the scorching heat spreading in some nations. Millions of people in Western Canada and the Northwestern United States were under heat alerts as the region baked in record-breaking temperatures and police reported scores of deaths likely related to scorching conditions. Vancouver broiling amid a historic heat wave. The average daily high temperature here for June and July, a balmy 21 degrees Celsius. In recent days, that's been more than doubled, with nearby Lytton breaking Canada's all-time national temperature record at 49 and a half degrees Celsius. Western Canada is being baked under what's known as a heat dome that has already caused hundreds of deaths. Heat near the Earth's surface typically dissipates as it rises. But when high pressure systems form in the upper atmosphere, that heat is pushed back downward, further warming as it's compressed closer to ground level. The cycle creates a tall dome of recirculating hot air whose high pressure pushes out sea winds and clouds that could bring relief. The effect is being felt further south in the U.S.'s Pacific Northwest as well, with record high temperatures and a number of fatalities. While heat domes aren't directly caused by climate change, they are made worse by droughts more directly linked to global warming, and they're getting worse as the planet as a whole heats up. North America's latest heat wave is also raising fears that this year's wildfire season could be longer and more severe than ever before. Not only in the United States and Canada, but India also experienced intense heat waves. According to climatologists, this can be mainly due to the intense global warming situations rising across the globe. Parts of northern India, including national capital New Delhi, reeled under severe heat wave conditions as the temperature soared to over 40 degrees Celsius. While traveling in the sun, people covered their faces, took refuge in the shade, and gulped down water and other coolants to protect themselves from sunburn and dehydration in New Delhi and Jaipur cities. Forecasts by the India Meteorological Department have suggested a rainfall by the 3rd of July in New Delhi. Temperatures so far this year have hit 43 degrees Celsius in the Indian capital. The humidity level hovered between 44 and 15 percent, according to weather department officials. May and June are usually the hottest months of the year in India, with temperatures more often ranging between 42 to 47 degrees Celsius before monsoon rains hit the region. Many states across India will continue to reel under intense heat as the weather department has forecast clear skies. Former U.S. President Donald Trump traveled to the U.S.-Mexico frontier to accuse President Joe Biden of neglecting national security by dismantling border controls. As criminal charges in New York appeared imminent against the company he founded and ran for decades, former President Donald Trump went to Texas on Wednesday to visit an unfinished section of border wall alongside the state's governor, Greg Abbott. This wall would have been completed. Seeking to capitalize on Republican attacks on President Joe Biden over the rise in illegal immigration, his latest effort to regain the national spotlight as media attention on the investigation into his business empire threatened to complicate his political future and his influence in Republican politics. Earlier at a meeting with Border Patrol and law enforcement, Trump reminded Abbott of his recent endorsement. I did notice your poll numbers are through the roof. And dangled one in front of Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who was also seeking re-election. Good luck, Ken. And I know you have a race, a little race coming up. Yep. Huh? Yeah, I know. And I'll be making an endorsement of somebody in the very near future. Trump's visit to the U.S.-Mexico border is his second public appearance this week after hammering Biden on immigration at a rally in Ohio on Saturday. Dismantled America's border defenses. But although Republicans have signaled that immigration will be a focus of their party's campaign in upcoming elections, 
Recent Reuters Ipsos polling suggests their attacks related to the issue are having little effect as 19 percent of Republicans listed immigration as a top priority, down 10 points from April. Prisoners, murderers, human traffickers, all of these people, drug dealers, are coming back into our country. Trump's speech at the southern border on Wednesday called to mind his first campaign announcement. They're bringing crime. It also came a day before the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer were expected to be criminally charged, according to a source familiar with the matter. While Trump himself was not expected to be charged, the case could interfere with his plans for a possible run for the White House in 2024. Italian authorities are searching for at least nine missing migrants after a boat capsized off the coast of Lampedusa. Let's cross over to other there in the world news special correspondent Nivartana Kahandavita from Benevento in Italy to give us more details. Nivartana? Yes, Anuradi. At least seven people are confirmed to have died in the shipwreck after rescue services recovered their bodies from the sea. Another 46 people are rescued and several Italian Coast Guard patrol boats are searching for the missing, including several children. The boat is believed to have overturned just as rescue crews arrived off the Sicilian island. Apparently, an estimated 60 people were packed into the 8-meter boat. The shipwreck, so close to the Italian coast, has caused outrage among local authorities and the mayor of Lampedusa has called for a meeting with the Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi. The capsize follows a night of numerous landings on Lampedusa. More than 250 migrants arrived on the small Italian island. Rescue NGOs say that around 700 people are missing or have died while trying to reach Europe across the central Mediterranean. Back to you and Rafi. Thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Nivartana Kahandavita reporting from Benevento in Italy. Now over to the Israel and Palestinian conflicts. Jewish settlers have agreed to leave a new West Bank outpost that has been the focus of protests. But some buildings, at least, are likely to remain, angering Palestinians who claim the land. Jewish settlers have agreed to quit a remote outpost that has become a flashpoint for clashes with Palestinians who also claim the land. They'll quit Givat Eviatar in the Israeli-occupied West Bank under an agreement with Israel's new government. But it looks likely that at least some of its buildings will remain, locked and under military guard, an outcome sure to anger Palestinians who want it removed. They've waged night disruption protests over the last few weeks, burning flaming torches and tires to send acrid smoke and a message into settler homes. Palestinian officials said Israeli soldiers have shot dead five Palestinians during stone-throwing protests since the outpost was set up. The settlement near the Palestinian city of Nablus grew rapidly. It was set up without permits in May and was soon home to more than 50 families. Israel's military ordered it to be cleared, presenting an early challenge to Israel's new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, who heads a pro-settler party. Settler leader Yossi Dagam said the families would leave voluntarily under the deal. The residents of Beta, a nearby Palestinian village, claim ownership of the land. The deputy mayor says protests will continue until it's returned to them. Most world powers deem the settlements, built on land Israel captured and occupied in a 1967 war, to be illegal. Israel disputes this, citing historical ties to the land and its own security needs. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now on the updates on the COVID crisis. More of Australia is going back inside as the Delta variant causes brand new clusters of infections, with many fearing that the pandemic will continue to intensify. Australia extended its COVID-19 lockdown and social distancing measures to more of the country on Wednesday. Four major cities are under a hard lockdown in a race to contain an outbreak of the highly contagious Delta variant. Around one in two Australians are under stay-at-home orders. The most populous state, New South Wales, reported 22 new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases on Wednesday, up slightly from the previous two days. 
New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian warned citizens to be alert and followed the restriction orders. The outback town of Alice Springs was also added to the list for stay-at-home orders after a potentially infected traveller used the airport. The first infection was detected in Sydney two weeks ago in a limousine driver who transported overseas airline crew. Meanwhile, less than 5% of the country's 20 million adult population has been fully vaccinated, leading to criticism of a sluggish national vaccination drive. One of the hardest hit sectors from the pandemic was the tourism industry. According to a UN study, it has been said that international tourism arrivals are set to stagnate this year, with the sector not expected to rebound until 2023. Many of the world's most iconic sites are still standing empty. A UN study has found that international tourism arrivals are set to stagnate this year, with the sector not expected to rebound until 2023. That will cause up to $2.4 trillion in further global losses for the tourism sector. The UN says tourism provides a lifeline to many countries, especially jobs in small island states. In 2020, international arrivals plunged by 73% from pre-pandemic levels. While domestic travel is expected to do well in Western markets, COVID-19 vaccination and certificates are key to restoring confidence in foreign tourism. Sandra Carvo is Chief of Market Intelligence and Competitiveness at the World Tourism Organization. So we all know there is an issue of the recognition of the vaccination certificates. Um, and this is an important point um, that needs also to be addressed. Um, and the second point is we do see positive signs of the US towards Europe. Um, there is interest. Um, obviously, again, this will very much depend on um, if Europe starts allowing US travelers back. Carvo says that it would be a very diverse recovery, varying by country and by region. On Thursday, the European Union's digital COVID-19 certificate is due to come into force. One small step to getting travel back on track. France is slowly showing signs of normalcy as restrictions are easing. However, there are warnings from experts that this could be leading into a fourth wave of the pandemic. Let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna from Normandy in France to give us more details. Chetana? Yes, Anurag. Restaurants in France are no longer limited to 50% of their normal capacity thanks to the latest easing of COVID restrictions. Shops, cinemas, theatres, museums and gyms have also been resuming an almost normal service. But the easing of restrictions has been delayed by a week in the southwestern region due to the high circulation of the Delta variant. The variant first detected in India now counts for one in five of all cases in France. Overall, the infection rate is continuing to fall as is the number of people treated for COVID in intensive care units. But the specialist who heads the government's COVID advisory panel is warning that the situation could deteriorate in autumn and could lead to a fourth wave. Furthermore, with at least 50% of the population partially vaccinated, the rate of inoculation process is slowing down. The government is considering measures to encourage people to get the jab by the end of summer. French government's leading scientific advisor professor says that the rollout of COVID vaccines would help mitigate the effect of this new wave of the virus, which many medical experts think could hit France by September or October. Back to you, Anurag. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. We have some good news for you. The European Commission has said it will work towards new laws to phase out caged animal farming across the bloc. The EU is proposing legislation that would phase out caged farming of animals. The European Commission says the move came after a citizen's petition calling for the ban gathered more than one million signatures. The Commission says it will propose legislation in 2023 to phase out and eventually ban caged farming for all animals covered by the citizen's proposal. That includes rabbits, young hens, quails, ducks and geese. 
Laying hens, sows and calves are already covered by EU rules on the use of cages. Although laying hens can be kept in furnished cages that provide more space than tightly packed battery cages. The EU Health Commissioner said in a statement to animals are sentient beings and we have a moral, societal responsibility to ensure that on-farm conditions for animals reflect this. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Bill Cosby was freed from prison after Pennsylvania's Supreme Court overturned his sexual assault conviction, saying he never should have faced charges after striking a non-prosecution deal with the previous district attorney more than 15 years ago. The Dukes of Cambridge and Sussex will meet later to unveil a statue of their mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, on what should have been her 60th birthday. Six more bodies were found overnight in the debris of a collapsed Miami area condominium tower, the mayor of Miami-Dade County said, bringing the confirmed death toll to nearly 18 a week after a major section of the building collapsed. The European Union agreed to a ceasefire with the United Kingdom in a post-Brexit dispute dubbed the Sausage War by extending a grace period for shipments of certain meat products from Britain to Northern Ireland. A hospital in the Indian city of Pune is battling against black fungus, a fungal infection that is adding to the suffering of patients recovering from COVID-19. Almost 2,300 anti-coup protesters in Myanmar have been released from prison. However, an advocacy group says the move could be intended to make room for more detainees in the future. United Airlines hopes to rise back to its usual sky-high levels of growth following a massive purchase of up to 270 planes ready for takeoff. The company expects to see steady post-pandemic growth. United Airlines unveiled its largest ever order of Boeing and Airbus jets on Tuesday as it gears up for post-pandemic growth. United, America's third largest airline by revenue, will replace most of its regional jets and overhaul its cabins with more premium seats. That's signaling a strong bet on the recovery of business travel and will enable United to better compete for both premium and low-cost trips. The 270-plane order will boost United's domestic capacity by almost 30 percent. 200 of those planes were purchased from Boeing, which has struggled to bounce back from a two-year safety crisis involving their 737 MAX aircraft. A quarter of the deal went to Europe's Airbus in a high-margin niche where Boeing faces a gap in its products, a longer-range, single-aisle plane. United, which received $10.5 billion in government aid during the pandemic, expects to add 25,000 union jobs, including pilots and flight attendants for the new jets. And finally tonight, an art performance was held in Beijing in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. Watching the performance at the National Stadium were party and state leaders and about 20,000 people. The Chinese president and other Chinese leaders walked onto the rostrum, waving to the cheering and applauding people. The performance started with a fireworks display illuminating the sky. The epic show, divided into four parts, depicts how the Chinese people, under the leadership of the CPC, have carried out revolution, construction and reform over the past 100 years. Important foreign friends, diplomatic envoys and representatives of international organizations in Beijing and foreign experts were also invited to the show. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of World News. I'm Anradi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.